And we are live. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, today, you'll have to forgive me a little bit for my voice. It's a little bit hoarse. It feels just like an ordinary cold. I suspect that's what it is. But these days, who knows? All right, let's get going. Uh, as uh, most of you know uh, by now, uh, my office is dedicated to separating sense from nonsense. That's what we do. We try to cast a light into the dark world of pseudoscience. We take aim at the snake oil salespeople and uh, hopefully replace that kind of nonsense with good scientific sense. Well, today we're going to talk a lot about nonsense and it is in the area of cancer. Now, there probably is no single word that is as frightening as, as this one. Cancer, of course, is not one disease. So no matter what you may hear, there will never be a cure for cancer. It doesn't work like that. The way that leukemia is treated is not the same way that breast cancer is treated. The only common feature that all cancers have is that cells multiply much more quickly than, than normal. The word cancer itself derives from the Latin for crab because the first tumors that were recognized were external tumors and they had a blood supply and the blood vessels look like the legs of a crab. So that's where the term comes from. It is a, a horrific disease in terms of the devastation it causes because about a half a million people die of cancer every year in uh, North America. That translates to about 1,500 a day. So that, of course, is significant. But you also have to remember that the uh, population of North America is over 400 million. There are many different kinds of, of, of cancer, of course. And we all fear death from cancer. But what we really fear, of course, is, is death from premature cancer. Because, I mean, let's face it, uh, eventually something is going to get you. So if someone dies at the age of 95 from cancer, uh, that isn't really uh, premature, right? So what we really are concerned about is premature cancer, is death from cancers that comes before the average life expectancy. And uh, this is a rough chart of uh, the incidence of premature cancer. And you can see that an unbalanced diet and smoking make up for about 65% of cases of premature cancer. You add infections to that uh, and uh, you know, you're at 75%. However, when you ask people in surveys what they think are the major causes of cancer, they'll tell you that it's pesticide residues, food additives, et cetera, which is not the case. It's the diet and smoking that are responsible. Now, the unbalanced diet, that's, that's a, a bit of an issue because we're not exactly sure what a balanced diet is. What we do know is that uh, populations that follow a mostly plant-based diet have a low rate of, of, of cancer. That's what we see epidemiologically. However, there is no cancer epidemic there is an increase in the total number of cases of cancer, which is not unexpected because the population increases. And also cancer is an age-related disease. So that as the average life expectancy increases, obviously that is going to increase the risk of cancer because the older you are, the greater the risk. But there is no epidemic of this disease, which can be readily demonstrated. And uh, here are uh, recent statistics. Now they only go up to about 2017 because of course it takes time to accumulate these kind of statistics. But uh, notice that um, the incidence of, of cancer uh, did increase around 1990, but that was because new diagnostic methods were introduced. That's when MRI was introduced, for example. But uh, if you take a look currently, you see that the incidence seems to be pretty stable and mortality goes down because treatments for cancer are, are getting better. 
So although there's no epidemic, I mean, obviously we still must do whatever we can in order to try to prevent this disease. And uh, modern medicine, of course, has come a long way with chemotherapy, with radiation, and with advances in, in surgery. Many people today are living who otherwise would not have died, would, would have died. However, uh, we also know that there are some cancers that, that are devastating, that there's not much that can be done about this. And this is what gives fuel to the quacks because they say that they can cure everything. A quack is someone who pretends to have medical knowledge that they do not actually have. And whenever science leaves a void, and unfortunately, in some cases of cancer, there is a void. I mean, when you know someone is, is diagnosed with something terrible like pancreatic cancer, <coughs> doctors have to say, well, there really isn't anything that we can do here. But those are words that you will never hear from a quack. They will always claim that they can solve the problem. They will always have the cure. What they are really adept at is taking your money because these treatments do not come cheap. So today we're going to discuss this, which is a rather frightening area, the extensive area of quackery in cancer treatment. Now, of course, I've discussed issues like this with you in the past, and we've emphasized science-based medicine. We've talked about various ways that, that drugs can be used and chemotherapy and radiation can be used. That's not what we're gonna address here today. We're going to address the other side of the coin, the quacks who claim to have all of the answers, but they have them without any evidence. It isn't surprising that there's a rich history of quackery when it comes to cancer, because whenever you have a disease that is difficult to battle, the quacks will step into the picture. So if we go back to the 1800s, we see ads like this, cancer can be cured. I want to send all sufferers from, I want to send to all sufferers from cancer these two books absolutely free. Well, of course, this is just nonsense, uh, but this was very prevalent in the, in the 1800s. For example, at this sanitarium, uh, the scientific treatment of cancer, they claim, without the use of the knife. Well, of course, there was no treatment here that, that worked. And the quacks have used all kinds of gimmicks. Look at this one here, offering $1,000 if they fail to cure the cancer. Well, of course, no one ever collects because they're dead. So it's really awful what was going on in, in, in those days. But unfortunately, this is not a, a relic of our historical past. There's a great deal of nonsense that uh, goes on today and that has been going on, you know, uh, even past uh, this era that I, I just talked about. So let me give you a couple of uh, examples here. First of all, let's look at Harry Hoxie, a pretty interesting character. And a number of books have been written about him, not very flattering, and they should not be. He held no medical degree of any kind, but that did not stop him from launching a whole array of cancer clinics in, uh, in the US. The argument, which is very prevalent with all of the quacks today, is that modern scientific medicine just cuts, burns, and poisons. And cut, of course, is the code word for surgery, burn for radiation, and poison for chemotherapy. And uh, the argument that was used by Huxley, and is still used by other quacks today, is that the scientific establishment does not really want to find effective treatments for cancer because it would then undermine their profits. <coughs> this is a, a scientifically bankrupt argument. Uh, of course, the scientific 
establishment would like to cure cancer. And no, there would be no loss of income because no matter what, you don't get out of life alive. So the medical community would just go on to focus on other diseases. This is exactly what they used to say about tuberculosis, that uh, uh, tuberculosis can be easily cured, but doctors don't want to cure it because it will take away their uh, profits from selling all of the ineffective therapies. Well, of course, um, tuberculosis today can be cured with antibiotics, and that has not stopped pharmaceutical companies or physicians from making a profit. But people like Huxley just present an image of the, quote, scientific establishment as being the harbinger of death, is that, that they are useless in whatever they do, and they just poison and, 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 and kill people. Whereas Huxley told us that you don't have to die. Note that the letters after his name are N.D., that stands for naturopathic doctor. Now, there are many diploma mills where you just send in some money and they will give you uh, basically a document saying that you have passed uh, their criteria for becoming a naturopathic doctor. These are the so-called diploma mills. Now, there are some legitimate schools of naturopathy. There's one in Toronto, for example where students actually study for four years and they take some scientific courses, although they're very weak courses, uh, and they get a degree in, in uh, naturopathy. Huxley never did that. He had his degree from a diploma mill. He had absolutely no scientific background. So where did his ideas come from? From his grandfather. His grandfather raised horses and one day, one of his horses developed a cancerous tumor on a leg. And the veterinarian said that the horse must be put down. And Hoxie didn't want that. He said, let nature take its course. And he just allowed the horse to go out into the pasture. Well, it turned out that the growth on the leg of the horse disappeared. What that was, who knows? But in any case, Hoxie's grandfather then went out and surveyed the pasture where this horse was living and found that the horse had been feasting on a variety of plants that grew there. And these were red clover and buckhorn and prickly ash and alfalfa. So he thought that this is the magical concoction that cured the horse. And he came up with the so-called Hoxi treatment, which included all of these. And for some reason, he added potassium iodide to it. <clears throat> Maybe because he had heard something about uh, the thyroid gland needing uh, iodine. So anyway, this is how the Hoxi formula uh, evolved. And he learned about this from his grandfather and came up with this mixture of these plant extracts and potassium iodide, and that became the Hoxi formula. And as I said earlier, he established a whole network of clinics which looked respectable. They had nurses, they had doctors, of course, who were quite highly paid in order to give people these bogus treatments. The, um, FDA eventually clamped down on Hoxie and warned the public uh, about this, that there was absolutely no evidence that this uh, treatment had any beneficial effects when it came to, to cancer. But Hoxie himself became the every man's hero because he was the one who stood up against the establishment. He was the one who criticized big pharma and big medicine as being incompetent, and he had all of the answers. And said, you know, doctors make millions with their needless surgery and radiation, and have no interest in providing cheap, effective therapies. 
And this is something that we hear over and over again these days from all kinds of, of uh, pseudo therapists. And they buttress their arguments. Huxley said, is it possible to sell a fake cure to 10,000 people for 30 years, despite the vociferous opposition of organized medicine and still attract 40 new patients a day? Well, the answer to that is yes, because that is exactly what what happened? The attraction is for desperate people. And of course, everyone would rather take some herbal concoction than subject themselves to chemo or radiation or surgery. So it's not surprising that he was able to drum up uh, a business. And of course, there's no follow up. So nobody knows whatever happened to the patients that he, he treated. I mean, he had all kinds of ridiculous views. Any man who has to resort to a biopsy lacks experience or mistrusts his own ability. Obviously, he tried to uh, turn people away from getting uh, biopsies. Well, the FDA went after him. And an FDA undercover agent went to Hoxie at his clinic. He was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer that had metastasized to the lung. Of course, he did not have this disease. And uh, he was guaranteed a cure. And uh, Hoxie told them that it's a lucky thing that he had come in because he came just in time for the disease to be arrested. Well, there was an arrest, all right, but it wasn't the disease. It was Hoxie for uh, promoting false cures. Now, many books have been written about this including some that give some credit to Hoxie. But of course, this comes from, from uh, uh, patients who may have actually benefited somehow, although nothing to do with the treatment. I mean, some people just spontaneously get better. And very often, the Hoxie treatment was used in conjunction with, with proper medical care. But of course, Hoxie got the credit. The Hoxie clinic still exists. There is one in, uh, in Tijuana in Mexico. Many of these alternative uh, therapy clinics are in Mexico because they have rather loose regulations there. And uh, of course, when it comes to, to science, what we ask is where is the evidence, right? We don't just dismiss it out of hand. We don't just say that, you know, it's impossible for alfalfa or burdock root to have an effect on, on cancer, who knows? Maybe there is some compound in there that works. But it is up to those who are making a claim to come up with the evidence for that claim. And when Hoxie is confronted, or was confronted, it's no longer with us, was confronted with uh, having to provide evidence, was not able to, to to do that. I mean, he did release some data. Well, this is what was found. Of 149 patients who had been treated, 85 could be tracked down after five years, and only 17 were still alive. So this is not a very good testimonial for the effectiveness of this treatment. You can even go into health food stores today and buy the Hoxie formula. Now, of course, they do not make the claim on the label that it cures cancer. That would be illegal. So they make these weasel claims, like immune support against degenerative conditions. It's a meaningless uh, claim. It cannot be proved one way or, or another. And interestingly enough, you even have competitors who sell Hoxie-like formula. If this worked, we already would know about it. There are enough people, desperate people, who have gone to Hoxie clinics, who have tried it. And if there was a significant improvement, we would have seen that epidemiologically. In Canada, Renee Kais, a former nurse, uh, also said that she had discovered the secret to treating cancer. And this came from her working with natives 
uh, indigenous people who of course were very adept at using all kinds of herbal uh, formulas. And uh, she believed that a product that she named Essiac for just reversing her name, her name was Kais, so just reversing it is, is Essiac, turned it upside down. Well, she turned many things upside down, turned science upside down, because again, we have no evidence of this. Now she undoubtedly was a good person and uh, believed that she had hit upon something that was effective. And she has been recognized, there is a statue uh, of her, and uh, this is the, uh, the story. In 1922, Nurse Kais discovered an original herbal formula that helped ease the pain and suffering of cancer patients. She named her herbal formula Essiac. Since 1922, thousands of people worldwide believe that Essiac helped to restore their health. Now notice what the wording says. Thousands of people believe. Well, just because you believe something doesn't make it true. Uh, during her lifetime, Renee Case refused to be lured away from uh, Bracebridge, Ontario, determined that her herbal remedy recognized as being made in Canada of herbs harvested from the Canadian Precumbrian uh, Shield on which this memorial stands. Nurse Kais insisted that Essiac, natural, safe, and effective herbal medicine made available to all mankind. So as I said, you know, she certainly was not a bad person. But as you can see from the claim here, for over 70 years, this herbal tonic has been reputed to aid in treatment against cancer. But just because it has been around for 70 years and reputed to aid doesn't mean that it did anything. We do not judge the effectiveness of a substance by how long it has been used. We judge it by the evidence. And the evidence is just not there. We once again note that it is marketed as a dietary supplement. And uh, it is much easier to get something marketed as a dietary supplement than as a drug. And uh, there is no uh, claim on the bottle again about what it does. Uh, but they do say, the statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Well, if it is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, why would anyone want to take this? So it's illegal to make an unsubstantiated claim on the product. However, in a brochure or in a book that you'll find beside the product on the shelves in the health food store, they can say all kinds of things. So there they will say that SEAC is an anti-cancer treatment, it eliminates toxins. Of course, those toxins are never named. Protects organs, what on earth does that mean? Purifies the blood, another meaningless statement. So I wish I could tell you that a mixture of burdock root and Turkish rhubarb and sheep sorrel and slippery elm bark uh, is the answer to cancer, but it isn't. And if it were, we would know about it because this thing has been around for a long enough time. It has been scientifically investigated. And unfortunately, there's just no evidence there. Now we come to Dr. Max Gerson another very, very interesting personality, but this time he was a legitimate medical doctor, properly trained in, in Germany. He suffered chronically from migraines and uh, he tried all kinds of things and eventually found that he resorted to a vegetarian diet. His uh, headaches lessened. Well, that was pretty interesting. Um, it's hard to say exactly you know, why that was. Uh, I mean, people do have various kinds of triggers for, for migraines. I mean, for some people, meat indeed is a trigger. So he just uh, lucked into a regimen whereby his pain uh, decreased. And then came uh, a large step. If uh, a diet such as that could stop migraine, then maybe it could also stop cancer in its tracks. So Max Gerson, who emigrated to the US, came up with his version of cancer treatment. And he 
suggested that a mixture of uh, potassium and Lugol solution and thyroid hormone and the other things that you see here was the key to treating cancer. How he came up with this mixture is, is really unknown. Uh, it is possible that some of these may have some physiological effect. But once again, you know, I hasten to point out that the burden of proof is always on the claimant. It is not up to the scientific community to show that something doesn't work. That's not how things get done. It is up to those who are making a claim to show that it does work. So anyway, this is part of the Gerson regimen, but his main emphasis is on vegetables and their juices. And in order to treat cancer, you have to juice the fruits and vegetables in a proper way. You have to use the right kind of juicer because as he says, or said, because again, he's no longer with us. He said that you have to have the right kind of juicer so that it doesn't destroy the enzymes in the food. This is total bunk. Enzymes are, are biological catalysts. They're protein molecules, and they have important biological functions. However, not when you consume them, because when you eat enzymes, just like any other protein, they get digested in the, in the stomach. Uh, there's no value to taking enzymes in, in that way, except for some rare cases where some digestive uh, uh, enzymes, which can be prescribed by physicians, can actually survive passage through the, uh, through the stomach. But anyway, the juicer that the Gerson people recommend is not cheap. Juicer costs about $2,000. And uh, if you don't use this juicer, then the regimen may not work because the Gerson people will tell you that some patients have failed to experience results simply by using the wrong juicer. Well, guess who sells the right juicer? And uh, a juicer is a juicer. You do not have to spend $2,000 for it. And of course, there really is no evidence that these juices are a treatment for, for cancer. But there are some other bizarre aspects to the Gerson therapy. For example, enemas. What kind of enema? A coffee enema. That's a standard in the uh, uh, Gerson uh, clinics. And you pump coffee through the rear portals. There is there isn't even a pseudo justification for this and why this, uh, this should work. Uh, but of course, uh, they don't provide any evidence. They get off scot-free because desperate people will try everything. Now there are laws in the United States and Canada about promoting ineffective therapies for serious diseases. And the Gerson clinics or institute, as they call themselves, get around this. So for example, in California, there is the Gerson Institute and Cancer Curing Society, but they do not offer any kind of treatment there because the FDA would go after them. So what they do is they steer people to go to Mexico or Hungary, actually, where there is a Gerson uh, clinic. And these days, the uh, Gerson establishment is run by Charlotte Gerson, who is uh, Max Gerson's uh, uh, daughter. And uh, you can go to these clinics in, in Mexico, in Tijuana, and uh, be pumped full of coffee through your ear and uh, drink liver juices and vegetable juices, whatever. Of course, when you ask them once again for evidence of benefit, they cannot provide it. I mean, we did this, we, we asked them. And at one time they gave us about 15 names 
of people that they said they had treated and cured of cancer. And uh, we were able to track down 13 of those people. And if I remember right, because it was a few years ago, uh, I think nine of them had already died and the others uh, were still suffering from cancer. So they, there was just no truth to their claim that they had done anything. The, uh, the story, however, uh, gives people hope because everyone would like to think that there are simple ways to battle this dreaded disease. And uh, there are books that have been written about the quote Gerson miracle, which is a miracle that does not exist. And there was a, even a movie that was made about it. And uh, if you watch that movie, you, you would conclude that, that uh, this is some very, very effective therapy that was repressed. And here was someone who had actually found the secret to curing cancer, but the world would not have it. The fact is that what they have are anecdotes and very, very selective follow-up. That is, once the patients leave the clinic after their coffee enemas and their juices or whatever, they don't follow up on what happens to them. So therefore they cannot provide any follow-up uh, information. Another movie, which is just as frightening as this one, because it really masks the truth, is a movie about Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski. Now, his is a very interesting story because once again, he is a, a legitimate physician. He went to medical school in Poland and eventually ended up in the, in the States and for a while worked as a legitimate cancer researcher. And then he started to claim that he had found a way to treat this awful disease. And that was by using substances that were present in the urine. And he called these anti-neoplastons. And uh, he said that these were uh, present in the urine of healthy people, but not in cancer patients. And therefore they had to be boosted uh, with this. He opened up a clinic in Texas, the Brzezinski uh, Clinic. And as you can see, a growing source of hope in the battle against cancer. And it's very big on that, giving people hope. They produce luxurious brochures <coughs> with pictures of, 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 of children they claim to have cured of, of cancer with his anti-neoplastons. And they have a whole uh, cache of uh, uh, anecdotes, stories. For example, at the Sydney Olympics, which was in, in 2000, uh, one of the uh, carriers of the torch was a lady by the name of Chantal Huron, who supposedly had been diagnosed with a brain tumor and was cured by the Brzezinski method. This got a lot of publicity. However, we don't know who did that diagnosis and what she actually had, what treatment she got other than Brzezinski. All we can say is great for her. I mean, if she really did have a brain tumor and uh, it was cured by whatever way, fine. But without knowing all of the details about exactly what she had and what treatment she, that she underwent, uh, we cannot just out and out swallow the claim that Brzezinski's anti-neoplastons uh, cured her. The important thing against Brzezinski is that he has never published anything in the peer-reviewed literature that would corroborate his claims. And that is a big smudge because that's how science works. When researchers carry out a study and they find results, they write this up in a proper scientific publication, which is then submitted to a journal. And the editor of the journal then sends this on to experts in the field called referees. They review the paper. And very often there's a lot of back and forth where 
the referees ask for more information. They may ask for some part of the research to be redone. And eventually a decision is made on whether or not this merits publication. However, peer review, of course, is not infallible because humans are not infallible. If someone is going to submit fraudulent results, it's very hard to, to catch that until someone tries to redo the work and finds that they can't. But Brzezinski has not submitted any kind of peer review papers to, to, or any kind of journals, papers to peer review journals. His institute does produce some very scientific looking papers, as you can see here, but this is not a peer reviewed publication. This is a publication by the institute itself. And curiously, even when you read the details of this, it's very questionable because even their own data does not support the claims that, that they make. They have very, very small numbers and uh, there's just no evidence here of efficacy, even though this is, is all done by, by the Brzezinski Institute. So how is it that in, in 40 years that this institute has been ongoing, they have not been able to submit a proper paper? I mean, since that time, they've treated thousands of patients. Where is that data? I mean, this would be not difficult to prove that if you've treated thousands of patients, then a large number of them would have gotten better by this treatment. Why have they not published that? So anyway, Brzezinski is very good at getting publicity. Uh, he gets on the talk shows. He was on with uh, Dr. Oz. And uh, what can I tell you? That is enough to cast a shadow on everything that Brzezinski says because uh, Oz seems to swallow pseudoscience with uh, great relish. You have probably heard of Laetril. Laetril is also a pseudoscientific treatment for, for cancer. And the argument here is that it is a molecule that releases cyanide and the cyanide will poison cancer cells. And the argument is that it will poison cancer cells more specifically than regular cells because cancer cells multiply more quickly. And therefore, if you throw a wrench into the works, it is going to affect the rapidly multiplying cells more than the normal cells. So this is, is not a, a scientifically bankrupt argument. I mean, this is, you know, it's a viable argument until you look into it because the active ingredient here is a substance called amygdalin. And if you take a look at the molecular structure here, which probably frightens some of you, at least you can see the C triple bond N in there, that's, the, that's cyanide. And when amygdalin is ingested, it will be metabolized, it, that is, it is broken down in the body and it actually does release cyanide. Where does amygdalin come from? It is found in apricot pits. Now, as I said earlier, uh, we never dismiss a claim based on its scientific implausibility because we may just not be thinking about it the right way. So once again, what we ask is where is the evidence? And Laetrile has been subjected to a number of studies because again, you know, you, it's possible that it could do something. And uh, the earliest study was way back in 1982, where they found that it did nothing for human cancer. And a number of other studies since that time have also found exactly the same thing. So there just isn't anything to this, but it's like, you know, this, this business is like whack-a-mole you whack them with one scientific study, nevertheless, they prop up somewhere else. So no, there's no magic cancer cure in apricot pits. And of course, on a product, you cannot make such a claim. So here, as you can see, this food for health product, 
bitter apricot kernels, they do not say anything about curing cancer. But I mean, that is the implication because why would anyone buy this? Because they have read somewhere that it is supposed to be beneficial for, for cancer. Now, not only does it not cure or treat cancer in any way, but there is actually enough cyanide in the bitter apricot kernels to cause cyanide poisoning. I mean, you'd, you'd have to eat a few of them, but it has happened because people think that if a little bit of something is good, then more must be better. Well, that is just not uh, the case here. There's absolutely no reason to eat uh, apricot kernels. Now we come to one of the most notorious uh, quacks. This is a gentleman who we first heard about under the name of John of God and was introduced to us by Oprah. Now this was at a time when uh, Oprah Winfrey was at the height of her popularity, when she had her daily afternoon television show with a huge audience. And uh, she went to uh, Mexico or to, to Brazil to uh, interview uh, the guy who called himself John of God, who essentially was a Brazilian pe peasant with absolutely no education but claimed that he was a messenger that had been sent by God in order to cure people. And he had a technique whereby he would treat people with, with cancer. And believe it or not, he would push surgical scissors up the nose because this he claimed somehow unblocked the energy channels in the body and allowed healing to take place. This is actually very impressive when you see it because you would think that pushing these surgical scissors up the nose as he does, you know, in, in depth is impossible. Therefore, you think that he's actually got some, some sort of magical talent. However, there's an old carnival trick that some of you may have seen, whereby a nail is put up the nose. And this is because most people do not know the anatomy here and that you can actually put the surgical scissors up the nose. Now, I'm not suggesting that you try this, but it is something that is very impressive when you see it. And, you know, it kind of sends the message that here is someone who's got some amazing talent. People flocked to his clinic from around the world. He quote treated thousands and thousands of, of people with uh, his, uh, his methods. However, he did more than just treat people. When it came to female patients, uh, he was not as interested in treating them as in having them treat him. And I won't elaborate on what that was all about, but I think you can guess. He was actually a sexual predator. Anyway, in 2015, he felt some abdominal pain and he did not try to treat that by pushing surgical scissors up his nose. He underwent endoscopy, turned out he had stomach cancer, and instead of his spiritual surgery, he had real medical surgery and they did manage to remove a, a tumor. When asked why he chose science rather than another faith healer like himself, John O'Connor replied, does the barber cut his own hair? Anyway, the story has kind of a just ending because many of the women that he had uh, treated eventually made complaints against him and he was arrested and he was tried and he was jailed for 19 years accused of raping four of the uh, of the women on compassionate grounds uh, when COVID hit he was allowed home and he's under house arrest but this is a despicable man who had uh, promised 
cancer cures to thousands of people, which of course he could not deliver. But on top of that, he had the history of abusing the women. The uh, quack cures keep coming. One of the more recent ones is Escozine. Escozine had its origin in Cuba. And it comes in a very, very pretty bottle. And uh, here are the claims uh, about what it can do. Again, there's no specific claim on the bottle that would be legal. But in these brochures, they will tell you that uh, uh, it can treat almost any disease that you've ever heard of, including cancer. What is it? It's venom from the blue scorpion. And it is this venom uh, that you get by milking the scorpion, which I suspect is not an easy thing to do. Uh, this is what cures cancer. Now, once again, they have not provided any evidence. And we cannot say that's impossible that this has any kind of an effect. I mean, you get these kind of anecdotes from you know people who say that they've been cured, but such anecdotes are always suspect because you never know whether there was a proper diagnosis and you never know what else, what other kind of treatments that they had undergone. And of course, there's no follow-up. So you don't know what eventually happened to these people. Now, it turns out that when you do laboratory experiments with this scorpion venom, uh, it may actually have some, some effect you know, in, in the Petri dish. But there are thousands and thousands of substances that can retard the growth of cancer cells in a Petri dish that never amount to any kind of uh, you know, clinical benefit. So nevertheless, uh, you know, hopeful people keep buying uh, this stuff. And here is one very interesting sort of uh, note about this blue scorpion venom. Here is a homeopathic version of it. Now in homeopathy, a substance is diluted to the extent that there isn't a single molecule of the original left. So, Never mind the fact that blue scorpion venom has no evidence for treating cancer. Certainly a homeopathic version is not going to do anything because it doesn't contain anything. Nevertheless, the treatment is popular. Why? Because desperate people will do desperate things. And when you are given a diagnosis of cancer, uh, people will reach out. And uh, if someone suggests that there is an easy solution to the problem, they will go for it. For example, LaseMed was a clinic and they used a particular type of laser treatment in order to stop cancer dead in its tracks, as it was told. The clinic was run by Antonella Carpenter who had a degree in physics. And she had concluded that it was possible to treat tumors by injecting them with a food dye and walnut extract, and then heating up the tumor with a laser. Once again, she was unable to provide any evidence of her treatment, but she, nevertheless, she treated a number of people for cancer. And she was found guilty. She was taken to task by regulatory agencies. She was found guilty on 29 counts of fraud tried to the uh, laser treatment. And uh, she was sentenced, she was put on, 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 on probation. And of course, she had a, a whole slew of uh, backers who claimed that she was a, a scapegoat and that uh, you know the uh, medical establishment was once again, just trying to eliminate her because she represented a danger to them because she would be eating into their profits. No this kind of laser treatment did not work, does not work. Uh, Dr. Carpenter is no longer with us. She passed away April, 2021. And uh, I don't know from what she passed away. There, there's just no information that I could uh, find. And uh, so I don't know what kind of disease that she had and, and whether or not she tried to treat, uh, treat herself. But I think with uh, her passing, uh, her clinic will also fade 
uh, away as it should. In Florida, we have the Hippocrates Institute, which is run by a gentleman called Brian Clement. He used to call himself a doctor. He no longer says that because it turns out that his medical degree came from a diploma mill. It was uh, in Montserrat, which is an island, and, and uh, they have a, a, a place there, which uh, basically for a fee will mail, mail you a diploma. He has no scientific background whatsoever. And uh, he runs this institute, the Hippocrates Institute, and they do some amazing things there. Based on modern biophysics and ancient Chinese medicine, color frequencies are applied to acupuncture points using a light pen and crystal rods. This promotes hormonal balance, detox, lymph flow, and immune support while reducing headaches and sleeplessness. Sounds pretty hokey because it is hokey. They have these crystal rods that they use for treatment. And uh, I mean, this is just obviously scientifically uh, implausible uh, and uh, you know uh, so this this business of you know working on cellular memory where the cause of disease resides color puncture promotes healing from within is absolute nonsense but they do something else at the hippocrates institute uh, they actually claim that you can cure cancer with a raw food diet and with the right supplements now, this is uh, one degree less outrageous than the other stuff that they say, because, you know, the diet probably does have an effect on, on cancer. I suspect not on curing it, but on preventing it, because we know, as I said earlier from epidemiological studies, that populations whose diet is mostly plant-based have a lower incidence of cancer than populations that have a meat-based diet. But here too, you have to be careful with you know, the interpretation because there are possibly other confounders here. They, for example, people who eat a plant-based diet may be less likely to smoke. They may be much more active physically than others. But nevertheless, I mean, there's no argument that I would want to make against eating, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables. That's a, it's, it's certainly a, a good thing to do, but I don't think that it's going to uh, to cure cancer. Uh, and then they are uh, also, of course, very happy to sell all kinds of supplements. Many of these establishments will sell all sorts of uh, supplements, like this one here, Conscious Brain. I don't know what it is: clean, raw, vegan dietary supplement. I don't think it does anything for the brain, uh, especially given the fact that I suspect that Brian Clement takes it because it's his product and his brain does not seem to work uh, extremely well. They sell another, a bunch of other very questionable things. For example, they claim that they can protect people from electromagnetic uh, uh, fields with a, a type of mineral called shungite, so-called because it was found in, in a village by that name in, in, in Russia. It's a very interesting mineral, which can be you know, fabricated into all kinds of, of shapes. But the whole idea that, that we need protection from electromagnetic fields is, is absolute nonsense. And uh, you know, they, they tell you that you should place these shungite uh, stones around your house wear a bracelet and this is going to protect you from cancer because cancer is caused by these electromagnetic fields. As you probably guess, uh, there has been a lot of stuff written about Brian Clement by proper you know, scientific uh, authorities and the government in Florida has also gone after him and uh, he was ordered to stop practicing medicine because he was pretending he was a doctor. He was basically practicing medicine without a license. But there's an unfortunate Canadian connection to Brian Clement. A lot of Canadians go to the you know, Hippocrates Institute, but uh, uh, unfortunately, two First Nations girls who had been diagnosed with, with uh, cancer. And uh, Clement told the parents that he could cure them. 
and uh, obviously he couldn't, but they gave up conventional treatment. So that is one of the, the big risks or one of the big objections against these quacks is that even if the treatments that they offer are innocuous, it steers people away from legitimate treatments. Well, finally, I mean, all of this sounds that we've talked about here sounds pretty hokey, right? But how about self-healing with Paida and Lajim? What is this all about? Well, it is a treatment for cancer, as you can see, for self-healing. In this case, they particularly focus in on, on breast cancer. And what are you supposed to do? Well, this time, you don't have to swallow anything. The only thing you have to swallow is a lot of bunk. Because these people claim that you can treat cancer essentially by just hitting yourself. Yeah, that's what this is all about. And you're supposed to just, uh, I wouldn't say tap yourself because you're supposed to use quite a bit of energy when you do this. And uh, there are these self-healing workshops where you have the so-called healers and they will bang away at you. And you can see in this particular case, this poor lady, and uh, they're banging away behind her knee. The skin is already red. Here's another case like that, where you know, they were trying to drive the disease out of the body by this, this uh, uh, banging on, on the skin. Now, of course, uh, authorities try to go after these people. And uh, this slapping therapist was arrested uh, because uh, he was charged with causing the death of an elderly woman in, in, the, in the UK. But again, you cannot put a stop to this totally because wherever there is a drastic disease and there's hope, the quacks will frolic. And you go into a bookstore these days and this is what you see. There are all kinds of books the cancer cure that worked, uh, world without cancer, right? The cancer cookbook, no dairy breast cancer, the cancer action plan. What do they have in common? They all sound very, very seductive, but none of them can give you any kind of evidence. So unfortunately, the quacks are out there and uh, they will keep hatching more and more quacks who will keep coming up with more and more bizarre treatments for disease. And the more outrageous it sounds, <laughs> very often, the more seductive it becomes. And uh, the quacks are there, they're in all colors and all sizes. And as Benjamin Franklin said, there are no greater liars than quacks except for their patients, because nobody wants to think that they have been had. And when people undergo some ridiculous treatment, they will claim that it worked because they don't want to admit that they did something so silly. But whatever these quacks offer, the fact is, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, because cancer is a difficult disease to manipulate, and there are no simple solutions. So that's it for our look at uh, quackery and, and cancer. And uh, I wish I could. I wish I could tell you that uh, uh, there were some uh, benefits to some of these, but they're not. Okay. So if there are any questions. We are open to questions. Let's give people a minute to uh, put them into the chat, or you can also raise your hand and I will unmute you. A complex topic. It is a complex topic, yeah. 
But if, if anyone has any, you know, uh, personal experience with uh, some questionable treatments, uh, you know, I'm always uh, interested in hearing that. None so far. Oh, we, we just have a thank you from, from Lynn. It could uh, speak to your point that people are reluctant to admit if they've tried something that... Right. <laughs> but I think also here we have a reasonably uh, intelligent audience, you know, so I, I don't think that... Uh, they would easily buy into the quackery. But unfortunately, you know, across the population, that's not the case. There are many, many people who do. Barbara says, hope you feel better. <laughs> yeah, well, I think a couple of days will do it. Well, thank you very much, okay, uh, thank Dr. You. Joe. And you're, oh, wait, someone, Boris is asking, is cancer a virus? No, cancer isn't a virus, although there are some viral conditions that can lead to, to cancer. For example, you know, the uh, HPV is a virus and that can lead to, to cancer. But no, cancer is generally not a viral disease. Perfect. Okay. Thank right. you so much. Your, your voice <laughs> held out, so we, we really appreciate it. It did. Thank you. We'll see you again in okay. May. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great day.